happy holidays, everybody. We're going to get started here. We are delighted today to share many of the wonderful and creative letters Santa Edwards and his elves received over the last few weeks. And what we hope will be some helpful holiday advice on how to address your learning wishes and woes. I first want to introduce our herd of helpers to ensure things go off without a hitch today. I'm Carrie Blitzen, and we have Hannah Von Vixen and Brittany Dasher here. And uh, after our little photo shoot we took this morning, Brittany dashed into the wall and broke one of her <laughs> antlers. And so we're going to have to get her off to the North Pole Clinic here ASAP following, following today's webinar. If anybody wants to share any comments today via Twitter, please use the hashtag eLearningSanta. And today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll be sending that link out shortly following the webinar, as along with some slides from today's presentation. So now I'm going to turn things over to Santa Edwards' elf, Lisa Spingle Stortzigal. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie, and a huge thanks to all the helpers in the workshop here. We have quite a crew. Um, and we are really busy monitoring the back channel, so please be active. Um, we welcome all your questions and we welcome all your comments. We'll be monitoring those and trying to respond to them throughout the webinar, or as always, we will always respond directly afterwards. Um, for those of you familiar with Ellen Interactions, um, and I must say personally, one of my favorite parts of being part of Santa's workshop is that we're really committed to sharing in the industry, um, and especially at this time of the year. So this is a great example of that. Um, we It's also a great example of user-driven content, right? All of the content from today's session. All the questions have come from you directly, so we're happy to share any expertise that we have that may be of value to you. Very important here to all of us at the North Pole. Um, the response was overwhelming, so thank you. A huge thank you to everyone out there. Yay. Appreciate it. Um, we know it's a very busy time of year, but we really got an overwhelming response on the letters. It was great to see a lot of the trends coming in on the various questions that we received. It gave us a lot of good ideas for future webinars, so thank you. And it was just amazing the amount of creativity that came in. So we'd like to kick off with a recorded letter from one of our clients that shows and exemplifies this creativity. This year, I'd like to request not something for me, but my team of the Hest. My wish list this year may be long and untoward, but each one is important to move learning forward. Gen Wires need many a sin challenge and game. Let's make their Xbox and Nintendo look lame. The Xers are easy to please, no big ask, but real life scenarios sure get them on task. Now boomers don't like all this PC based stuff, but weave in a story for meaningful fluff. Matures are much harder, but think, if you will, of some courses where clear ROI's not a pill. Make it easy and fun. Make it feature-filled. Let instructional designers add flair when they build. Give me images, videos, interactions, and toys for new hire and tenured, for girls and for boys. And last but not least, if you could, if you please, Get me some learners who take training with ease, who jump right out of bed in the morning to find what new courses there are for expanding their mind. That is it, that is all, not such a big list. Without learning this year, all our goals would be missed. If we get all these treats for us under the tree, we promise to share them with joy and with glee. You'll experience the fruits of our labor and then we can celebrate learning with family and friends. Happy holidays. Thanks, Stephanie. That was great. And we really admire, um, if you saw the letter come in, it was very um, gleeful and joyful. And she took a lot of time and work putting that together. So a huge thank you to her. Also love mentioning all the various generations in the workplace. We do a lot of work in that area and happy to share that knowledge at a future date as well. She uh, mentioned a great quote in there, without learning this year, our goals would be missed. And that really summarized what Santa's gonna share today. It's all about performance. Um, today in particular, based on all your questions coming in, we are going to be covering reining in the SMEs. We've got a lot of questions around that. How do we keep all the SMEs in order? Um, Santa will share a lot of delightful design tips. He'll share insights in creating more meaningful learning. 
and ways to ensure learning transfer. So without further ado, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering about 12 letters today, and Santa's going to be responding to them. And we're going to have lots and lots of helpful um, pieces to follow up for you at following the webinar, um, ways you can stay engaged, and um, lots of great tools you can use. So our first letter, Dear Santa, I would really love a way to keep the elves from adding too much content that distracts from the scope of the toy. P.S. Could you help some of my content authors? I think they may have made the naughty list. Signed, Wendy and Candy. Santa, can you help? I sure will try, Lisa Fingle. Uh, Wendy and Candy, that's a really common problem that people have. You know, sometimes I think lives of instructional designers would be so much easier if they didn't have SMEs to worry about. Because they're just often like Grinches that come in and try to make things so complicated. And one of the things that they often do is just have too much content. <clears throat> now, I have a little gift for you that I hope you can find in your stocking. Um, and it's something you can get from the Allen Interactions website. It's a white paper called The Five Most Important Analysis Questions You'll Ever Ask. And these are some things that you can do to work with your SMEs early on to try to get them to understand the process and to get some agreement. Now, I'm just going to talk about one of those points right now. And one of those things is that so often SMEs come to you with telling you what you need to know, what your learners need to know. And what you want to do is push back to them and say, you know, we need to ask, what do you expect learners to be able to do? Um, that really cuts through a lot of that overwhelming amount of content um, in a really practical way because you know it's really good for people to know a lot but a lot of times that stuff doesn't really impact um, the immediacy. So um, I had a, a little story to share with you because not long ago my chief SME elf Ebenezer came to me with things to say um, we have to do some big training to our elf fact. And here, here's all the things I need to teach. I need to have, we need to teach a history of giggling. We need to do the toils for toy, tools for toy making. We need workshop safety. We need reindeer husbandry. And then the final unit is going to be annoying elf tricks. And I said, oh, hold on, Ebenezer. That's too much. If we, if we spend all that time, our elves are never going to have any time getting ready for Christmas. So what are we going to do to, to figure out what's going to actually be useful? So we sat down, and I asked Ebenezer to tell me exactly what the people need to do. And he thought a bit, and he said, well, we need to train them how to build toys. They need to be able to build toys. And I said, okay, that's good. What else? Well, when they're done, they need to be able to load the sleigh. And then they also need to be able to feed those reindeer. And I said, yeah, that's, those are a good set of tasks. Now let's make a little chart, and we can see what information our elves need to know to be able to do these tasks. As you can see, we see that you know the tools for toy making really is essential for being able to build toys. Workshop safety is helpful if you're going to build toys and load the sleigh. And reindeer husbandry really helps feed reindeer. But by making a chart like this, it's clear that you know the history of giggling doesn't actually enable learners to do any of the things that are important. And to do and those annoying elf tricks. It might be fun to have those around, but again, they're not going to make a difference on our getting our work done by Christmas Eve. And so what we can do, and I took this back to Ebenezer, I said, see, we only really have to teach tools for toy making, workshop safety, and reindeer husbandry. And that made the job so much easier, and we could focus it entirely on those tasks. So I really recommend to ask that question with your SMEs. Don't let them leave and let you do it. You need to make sure that they agree that this chart is complete and accurate. And if you can really show that a whole column of content isn't really affecting your outcome, that's some really strong evidence you can use to say we can pare down so much of this content that you think is necessary. And a lot of times it's there just because it was taught forever before. And so hopefully that's a good um, technique. It's what we do always as sort of the first step of analysis. And then remember, go, go get that white paper for the other four steps. Now here's an example just to see how that works out. Um, we had a chance to teach police officers how to recognize gangs. Now you might know that gangs, those, those are some boys that are being very, very, very naughty. And you need to be able to find out where they're doing activity. 
So instead of the lesson starting with a whole bunch of information about gangs, it put the learner in a squad car, and they're driving down the street, and they can look, and they can identify when they think there's gang activity indicators, so they can report that and do something about it. You see, you can find some things, and there's some of these things are just regular graffiti. Um, now, you may be wondering, well, this is very interesting, but what if one of the learners doesn't know anything about this? What are they supposed to do? Well, you can go up to Gangs 411 anytime, which is a little notebook that you can navigate through, and you can find all about the indicators, you can read about what are the criteria, and you can come in and out of this to find about the different gangs. But the point of this is that we're not starting with all this content, because um, this would take forever, and it can get really boring and disengaging. Instead, we put the learner right into a performance environment <clears throat> where they have to apply that knowledge, and if they don't know it, it's so much more useful to read it and do that research when there's a challenge at hand. So the way this works is you continue on down the street, and at the very end of your patrol, you get some summary um, feedback. It has to do with how many false... Um, false cues you found, how many things you missed, and there's a number of different scenes that you can go through, and it really is a great way to make sure that people understand all the various graffiti marks and, and indicators of gang activity. So how do you like that, Lisa Pingle? I love that, Santa. But hey, remind me to ask you about the elf tricks that you consider annoying. I noticed that on your chart. <laughs> oh, you know what they are. <laughs> so let's go to another letter. Dear Santa, I wish for coal in the stocking of those who nitpick everything to death to hold up a course. Sign, Fridia. Oh, Fridia. I've had that problem myself. <clears throat> but I'm afraid you're just asking a little too much. <laughs> you're always going to have those nitpickers um, around. And you got to just get a help to figure out a way that they can get focused on the end result and what's really going to help the learner. One of my most frustrating times is one time I was working on a lesson and I knew that there were some problems that you know some of the questions weren't quite right and getting the feedback right and I couldn't get my subject matter expert to talk about anything about but whether there were periods at the end of the bullet points and I kept thinking we need to decide that but that's not going to make the difference between this being a good lesson or not and yet it was impossible to get people to get off those little tiny details and think about really what makes a difference to the learner. Thank you, Santa. So, dear Santa, I would like clever instructional design tips to guide us through the ID process. We need creative ideas to engage our learners. Sign, Sharon. And Santa, I know you have a big red bag full of ideas on this one. Well, you know, this is the biggest thing that you need to work on to create good e-learning is to figure out how to engage the learners. And <clears throat> there's a number of design principles that I think really work well, and they're all focused on how to create engaging learning experiences. And the core of that is this idea that we call instructional interactivity. <clears throat> and there are four components that you need to work into an interaction to make it engaging. Those four are the context, the challenge, the activity, and the feedback. Now, the context is everything that sets the stage for the question. If it could put you into a simulated environment, it could just show a picture, it could tell a little story. But, you know, content doesn't make sense on its own. And learners often don't know why things are significant. And so one of the first tasks is to create context that's going to tell the learner why this is important, what's in it for them. And once you have that context set, then people know what they might be able to be doing. And you want people to be proactive and energized and feeling challenged to, be, to come up with a good, correct answer. And so you need to have a challenge that actually means something. And so often e-learning challenges are just, can you make it through? Can you get to the end? Well, that's more of a punishment than a challenge. And what you want people is to feel like, I have a positive goal, I want to... You know, I want to save lives, or I want to make my neighborhood more um, safe from gang activity, or I want to be able to sell more units than anybody else, and you want that challenge to be very much part of it. And so it's not a challenge for being, being good in the lesson, it's a challenge to be good in the performance environment. But once you have people energized to do challenge, then they need to do something. And activities make a huge difference in how people can 
take what they're learning and transfer it. But so often e-learning, the activities are meaningless. It's like hitting the next key or clicking A, B, C, or D or some very arbitrary activity that frankly doesn't mean anything. What you want to do instead is have the activity suggest to the learner what they're going to do when they're on their own. Just like you saw in that last gang example, you weren't asking questions, but you were actually driving through a neighborhood and identifying by picking them out of the, of the background things that were indicators of gang activity. So whenever you can make things appear to be like the real end activity, um, and you know if you're teaching somebody to, to sell something, you want them to be picking actual statements, how they would interact with somebody, rather than talking about the rules of a selling process. So you get the idea there. And then finally, you need to have feedback. Feedback is how it reflects back to the learner how well they're doing. And that's really where the learning takes place. You know, you don't learn unless you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, that's the perfect opportunity for feedback to tell you all the things that you need to know um, and, the, and the shortcomings that you were demonstrating and how you responded to the challenge. So when you get all those things together, context, challenge, activity, and feedback, each time you have the learner doing something, you're going to end up with memorable, meaningful, and motivational interactions. And there's a little, another little gift for you. There's another white paper about creating meaningful um, interactions that make a difference. That you can get more information again if you download that from our, um, intera our Allen Interactions website. And there'll be instructions at the very end how to do that. But again, these are going to create meaningful, memorable, and motivational. Mm -mm -mm. I know you like that, Lisa. I do. I like that better than eggnog, Santa. Thank you. So, Santa, what I'd really like for Christmas, besides world peace, is a better system for taking the detailed content and making it meaningful for our learners. Signed, Candy. Santa? Candy. I know you like that letter, Lisa. You know. <laughs> I love candy. Yeah, well, here's one more gift. I know you're, you're probably thinking I'm giving you the too many things to read. But you can download these and over time study them. But there's one other paper that's called The Five Design Activities for Creating Impactful E-Learning. Because, you know, design is where you come up with those really engaging ideas. During the analysis, um, when you first start, you're doing backgrounding. And then you have to sit at a blank piece of paper and think, what am I going to put on the screen? Now here's a couple of the, here are the five things I'll tell you up front, and you can read more about them. But there's some of the things that you might not have thought of. First off, you don't want to start with storyboards. Some people maybe have told you that that's the only way to go about it, but there's a much better way to do it. Um, the problem with storyboards, as your initial tool, you know you may need to do it later down the road, but it's not a great place to start because storyboards are more about documenting something that's already existing. And people tend to get very repetitive and focus on details before they even know what a big idea is. And so that's a really great way to get boring e-learning. So what you should do is not start with storyboards and instead use prototypes and sketches to get your good ideas out first. And so don't worry about the details like what words are going to be on the screen or exactly what the content is. But you know, when you do that chart about what learners need to do, Take one of those activities and start sketching out an, an interaction that how what context might make that possible, how could you work a challenge in there, and then think about the activities. And, and by um, prototyping, you can see very quickly if an idea is good or not. And then don't be afraid to change it. Um, if, you don't, if you haven't invested that much time in it yet, it's really easy to go back and say, you know, I thought that was a really good idea. but Maybe it wasn't because uh, learners aren't able to, to see, get the main point. So you can step back before you've invested any time in it and fix it. Now, the other thing that goes along with that is don't necessarily work linearly. What I mean by that is don't start at the very first thing and go to the end. Um, because oftentimes, you're, all your focus will be on things that aren't very important. And when you get to the end, which is where the really good stuff is, you're going to be rushed and you're going to not do it justice. So what works much better is to pick your main outcomes and really figure out what are the, the final interactions and make those work great and get that out. And then you'll find that you can fill in all the gaps 
really easily you know, any kind of preliminary information that needs to be done. But, but if you start there, you never get to the good ideas. Another one that is going to sound sort of funny is, but it really makes a big difference, is just pretend that your learners can't read. Um, now, we know they can read, but unfortunately, learners are often sort of naughty, and they don't like to read on the screen, and they skip forward. And even though you say, please read everything on the screen, they don't. And so what you need to try to do is think, how can I convey this knowing that half of my learners are going to have not read the words I put on the screen? So it really changes the way you, you create your learning. You make things very visual. You don't spoon feed information. You let people find it. And it gives them a reason to stay involved. And then to make sure that as you're doing that, you're not making some wrong mistakes. Make sure you seek input early so that you're always letting end users review your work early on so you can make sure that you're in line with their needs. Now, I think Lisa Pingle has another example to show here. Um, this is... I do, Sam. Well, no, we're going to... That's going to be a little bit later, isn't it, Lisa? Yeah, just a little bit later. We're going to go to another letter. But before that, we just want to remind everybody out there that we really welcome your comments and questions. Be sure to be putting them in the chat window. We're monitoring them, and we'll share them with the broader audience as they come in. So make sure that you're keeping that back window, um, back uh, channel active. So let's go to this letter, Santa. I think you'll really enjoy it. Santa, I know our users are getting bored, and we are too. If you could fill our stockings with some fresh ideas for learning activities, we'd really appreciate it. Signed, Jeremy. What have you got, Santa? Well, Jeremy, there's a lot of ideas. And if you go to our website, you'll find that some demos that will help. And what my advice is just keep looking and thinking how the examples you see that work how you might be able to shift them and twist them to make them fit for your learning um, learning challenges. Now, what I really want you to do is think about, and here's a really simple one, and but it's it's really a, a function of using that format of context, challenge, activity, and feedback, and making things look visual and not relying on reading too much text. So this is a straightforward example about how you can be a, a supervisor and prevent um, emergencies and tragedies from happening in your workplace. So the thing is, you've got this view of your workers, and as you roll over them, some of them have some pretty naughty things to say. This person, my boyfriend was so late getting to my place, we missed the movie, I wanted to kill him. Oh my, here's another person, I hate this blankly blank project, everyone is stupid and blankly blank incompetent. They're not thinking about being very good, I'm afraid. But here's one. Two things would solve this department's problems, gasoline and a match. Some days you just want to end it all. Oh. And this stupid printer always screws up documents. I really hate this dumb machine. Now, if you step back and look at this from an instructional designer's point of view, you can see how it's very carefully crafting some choices for the learner to, to apply the recording rules of of what is the most troubling situation. Well, let's, I think this woman who is suggesting that she wants to end it all may be the most um, troubling. So let's move that up to our office. And here we got feedback. Well, this employee is definitely troubled. There is another situation in the office more pressing. Please try to find the higher ranking concern. Okay, so something else that I need to think about this better. What might be the well, this fight, if he would really do this, this would cause a lot of damage. So let's try him. Let's go to the office. Absolutely, an employee who threatens implicitly or explicitly other employees is the highest priority and must be dealt with first. I hope you can see how this is illustrating that context, challenge, activity, and feedback. Because here in this feedback, it's giving me rules about what a corning troubling situation is. I'm going to follow that up with having to explore some more information. We can ask what's upsetting you. I and mean, we I never get any real work done. I'm stuck in a rut, and every time I try to get myself out of it, someone pulls me back. So clearly, Toby is having some continuing issues. Let's ask him if he could do it by Thursday, because we have a big meeting Friday. Ah, huh, that's a good one. Hmm, that wasn't such a good question to ask, because we didn't get any good information to help us decide. But I think we need to refer him so we're ready. We go on, and then the next task would be to take him to the office. Now, I encourage you to take a look at this in more detail and realize that this is a very straightforward 
lesson. It's just a series of some multiple choice questions, but because the learner is doing something, that they're faced with a challenge rather than simply being asked to remember something or to repeat what was said on the previous screen, or in most likely cases, just to guess, um, because this is a meaningful challenge, people are engaged, uh, and then the information flows through it in a very much more uh, meaningful way. So this is what we really strive for. And this is just one example, and again, you can see a lot more on our website, but really that the basis of all of this is understanding that principle of context, challenge, activity, and feedback as your structure for building any interaction. Perfect. Thank you, Santa. Oh, here come the reindeer. They just brought in a question from the audience. So Santa, here's a question for you. Prototyping is really only effective if the authoring tool you use is fast and easy. What sort of tool do you, tool do you suggest for prototyping? Signed, Isabel. Well, Isabel, that's a really good point because if you're struggling to illustrate an idea in your prototyping tool, it'll defeat the purpose because once you've worked to get going, you're not going to want to discard it. And one of the biggest values of prototyping is you can do it quick, and if it doesn't work out, you can throw it away. So there's a number of tools that you can use, and the main thing to remember is that a prototype doesn't absolutely have to work. And what you might want keep those reindeer down back there. <laughs> uh, what you want to do is use a tool like, I mean, sometimes some of my colleagues have used PowerPoint, um, not because that's a good tool at all for developing e-learning, but you can very quickly present some screens and use some um, motion, some of the animation things to make it appear that animation is occurring. Some people use Dreamweaver. Again, not that you'd ever re use a lesson in Dreamweaver, but it does allow you to put some basic interactivity together. I even know some people who just use drawing tools like PowerPoint or Fireworks and use the various le levels. Now, of course, it's better if you use something that has interactivity. And so if you're a real pro at Captivate or Lectora, you could maybe use those. There's a new tool I'm going to tell you about a little bit later that we're using quite a bit here at Allen Interactions and having great success, and it's Zebra Zaps. And what's great about it is it allows you to do really, you know, something on the order of, of the example I just showed you. Um, you know, in a matter of five or five months, that could have been built. You're not with those graphics, but you could have little placeholders, and that's the sort of thing you want. So any of those tools, but your main point is the right one, is if you're struggling with your prototyping tool, then you have to find something that's simpler. Perfect. Thank you so much, Santa. Here's a great letter for you. Learning attrition remains a major challenge. Much of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are taught and learned are not transferred to job performance. Signed, Everett. Santa, what did you have for Everett? Well, Everett, you've, you've hit probably the biggest challenge of training and, and coming trying to figure out how to justify all the money that's spent on training. A lot of people call that ROI in a way, because if you train, and it doesn't matter what people's scores are, if they don't end up changing what they do on the job. Now, I, I, one of the biggest ways to do that, I think, is managing the context that you build in your instruction. You know, a lot of times when you're in a classroom, teachers add that by telling case stories and, 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 and doing experiments and field trips and all those sorts of things add context. When you're dealing with e-learning, it's harder to do that. Now, here's a little example I want to share with you um, to sort of illustrate the power of context. We were faced with um, a really unusual training program, which was that the, an organization called Operation Lifesaver, which is focused on trying to make um, the rails, the train industry safer. So there are fewer accidents, fewer deaths, and so forth. And one of the places they wanted to focus on was truck drivers. Um, there's just a on, it's a surprisingly large number of accidents that happen with trains and trucks, with the trucks getting caught on tracks and so forth. So they wanted to have a lesson to teach that. But when you looked at what the content was, it was what you sort of see on the screen here. There was a set of six steps that all truck drivers were supposed to pay attention to, and they all make a lot of sense. Slow down when you're approaching a crossing, remove the distractions, like turn off your radio, look both ways, 
Um, you roll down the window and listen, <clears throat> obey whatever controls and signs are at the site, and then when all of that is done, then you proceed with caution. <clears throat> now, in addition to that, part of the content were these street signs. You know, it's important that all truck drivers need to know what a stop sign, a yield sign is, and what the railroad crossing signs look like, and all the different indicators that go along with that. And then finally, there was some stuff that was very specific to trucks, which is knowing how big your truck is, how much space needs to be on one side of the, the tracks, how long does it take to stop, and so forth. Now, what's interesting, though, is if you would talk to most any truck driver, they would have no difficulty with this information. In fact, they probably know it all, and if they, you'd ask them what are you supposed to do, they might even be able to tell you all these things, and they probably wouldn't have any problem recognizing the signs. But in spite of that, there's just a huge amount of, of accidents. And I think what's problem, the problem with most training is that it, it focuses on the content, like what we see on the screen here, without giving the chance to, the learner the chance to practice in, in a meaningful context. So when we created a training lesson, um, we created something that's very rich in context. So here's um, the idea is you, you're going to go on a trip. So here we are in the cab of our truck driving down the highway. There's radio controls, a CB radio, a phone, and we just need to make sure that we cross any tracks we come safely. So here in the distance we see a railroad crossing coming up. And as we get closer, we see that there's a stop sign. So we need to start slowing down. And then as we approach the white line, when we get right up to it, we will, we will stop. And now we might want to roll down the windows so we can hear if there's a train whistle coming and look both directions. It looks clear, so let's proceed. And being able to do that, we applied all six of those rules, but in a way that's much more meaningful than just having answered a question about what are the six steps. So we continue on our way. Now our radio is playing. We're feeling confident. Here comes another railroad crossing. You turn the radio on. Field and it doesn't seem... Oh, and oh my, something bad happened. We didn't do our safety steps. We failed to stop. We were hit by a train. And so we didn't. And so we're going to have to start the trip over again. But what I think you can see that it's that kind of a factor that's going to help learners take this information and and be aware of how to apply it when they're actually on the job. And I and we really found that context is that determining factor to to have e-learning have an impact on the real world. Thank you, Santa. That was great. Why don't we go to our hand raise out there? How many of you found that last um, learning piece engaging? A piece you'd actually want to take, that piece we just showed. Just a raise of hands out there, everyone. Oh, a great turnout. So you can see clearly how important context is. And again, context is mentioned in one of those um, papers that Santa is recommending and that we'll be having at the end. So thank you, Santa. So Santa, and keep those uh, questions coming in. We're getting some great questions we're going to be handling here in a few minutes and a few comments, so thank you. So Santa, I wish you could send new glasses to the management so they can see the world differently outside of their theoretical PowerPoint presentations. Signed, Julie. Oh, Julie, that is such a big problem. And it's so bad, you know, people who don't day-to-day -day face um, learners and face the problems of of um, getting things done, don't realize how difficult it is. And unfortunately, we don't have a good solution. So elves, you get on that right away. Oh, we're on it, Santa. A um, couple it more really questions. Is a problem. Go ahead, Santa. It is, yeah, it is something that really is important that you need to work with your, um, your management as possible, much as possible to show them examples. A lot of times they just haven't seen better e-learning. And they think that all of this is putting PowerPoints on the web and asking a few silly questions. And if they can see a few of these examples that really change the way learners work, they may start getting out of that rut. But elves, you've got to get helping on that too. 
Absolutely, Santa. We really believe that if it's boring to make, it's going to be boring to take. So make sure you have fun making it, and you'll make meaningful, memorable, motivational, good learning. So thank you. A couple of questions coming in, Santa. Okay. Great. Um, for the security one, what authoring tool did you use to create that interaction? You know, that was built in Flash, but, you know, that's a really, that's a tool, that, a, a lesson that was written a number of years ago. And at that time, it was really hard in any other tool to do much of anything. But you should look at that and realize that it's pretty simple and that you could almost build that in whatever tool you want, in Lectora or Captivate or Storyline, because it's just a matter of um, creating some simple interactions, but it's creating that global graphic context that makes it feel so interesting. And of course, again, we're going to talk about it in a minute, Zebra would be a really the best tool to use for that because it really focuses on making those actions at the center of your design. Perfect. Thank you. Here's a great letter, Santa. Santa, I'd li mostly like a pony, and also I'd like an interactive design process that doesn't look like I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Signed, Rhea. Well, Rhea, I think we'd all like ponies. Um, <laughs> so hopefully you can talk, you can um, see a surprise in your stocking on that. I can help you right now about your iterative design process. And I think you're probably comparing that to the sort of traditional ISD process, which is called ADDY, which in its classic case is very linear. And, it's, and while a lot of those basic activities that you do in ADDY are worthwhile, the linearity and the sort of the, the compartmentalization of it makes it difficult. And so what we use is something called SAM, the Successive Approximation Model. And what we do is we, we start pretty much the same way as in Addy in doing background. You start doing some analysis, gathering as much information as you can, and then you start designing. But the thing is you don't start designing right from the beginning. You start trying to think of what would be some key interactions, what would be the core of this lesson to make it work. And you design that out sometimes by, we call it whiteboard prototyping often, to just get some ideas out. And then very quickly, we create a really working online prototype. So, you know, the question somebody asked earlier about what tools to use, we might use a, a very simple sketching tool or build a simple thing in Zebra. Um, or you might just pull a PowerPoint. But the idea is to get an online representation of what the interaction might be like. But you do this really quickly, in a couple of hours is ideal. And you don't worry about what it looks like, you just use stick figures, line drawings, you don't write out text. A lot of times ours just say blah, 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 instead of worrying about writing content. But that's enough to put it in front of some of your team members and even a little bit later in front of some potential students to see what they think. And you know, one of the hard things to realize as a designer is it's impossible for you to really review your own work. Because if you didn't think it was a good idea, you wouldn't have put it down in the first place. And sometimes our good ideas aren't as good as we think they are. And so it's really important to put have somebody else um, help you in that review process. And so what you'll find is that there are some good things about your prototype and probably some things that need adjusting. So you go back and continue designing. You see that little circular loop. You redesign. You change some things. You maybe sometimes you maybe have to throw the whole thing away. Sometimes you just have to tweak a little tiny bit of it. But you change that design and implement that in the prototype and review. And what you'll find is if you do this really quickly, you know, like an hour or two for each prototype of work, and then um, another hour of reviewing and talking, you're going to find in a matter of a day or two, you're going to have proceeded from a blank sheet into a really engaging interaction. And when you do that to get the core of your lesson planned out, then you start moving over into the next part of this diagram, the development phase, where you really start developing it. That's when you start worrying about what are the words that I'm going to put on the screen, maybe hiring a graphic artist or get somebody to draw the illustrations, and start implementing it in your final authoring tool. You know, you could have just been sketching and in um, Dreamweaver doing your prototypes, but now you're going to start opening up Lectora or Flash or whatever tool to start developing. And then 
But another really important thing is you don't just start developing everything out. You work one little piece to be complete, and that's what we call the design proof. You see that in the bar across the bottom. And that is one piece of the lesson that you can really count on to represent how it's going to look like, what the type of writing is going to be, how one interaction will work, how the feedback will work. And then once that's approved, that's sort of the last point you have to make any significant changes to the design. And then you start really implementing and evaluating and, and working out through your alpha version, get some feedback, make those changes. Hopefully they're going to be very small if you've done the design proof right. Then you get your beta, which you use also evaluate. Usually that should just be a matter of fixing grammar errors and or tiny little shifts, and then you're ready to produce your goal. But I think this iterative design process, um, it doesn't really take any longer than the standard process. It just opens up your possibilities for being more creative, coming up with better interactions that are sort of proved through these prototypes before you've invested in them. And then um, you have a, a, a better model for developing it clearly and coming up with the end product um, at a, in a timely way. And that you know you've got the best interactions that you could have gotten for that level of investment in resources and time. Now there's one other little stocking stuffer you might want to be aware of. There's a new book that my friend Dr. Michael Allen just released called Leaving Addy for Sam. It's published through the ASTD and it's a, a nice book that talks about this in much greater detail if you're curious about how you might implement that sort of iterative design. Thanks. And we love Sam in the workshop. That's that's definitely, and Dr. Allen's our star. So thank you. That's a great gift for the holidays. So we're getting a lot of questions in the back channel, and we want them to keep coming in, too. A lot of people are wishing for graphic designers for Christmas, Santa. So we'll address yeah, that here in a little bit. <laughs> you know, that's something that's really important. And a lot of, a lot of people forget how important the way things look um, matters. And, you know, and 20 years ago when we used to give e-learning for Christmas, it could be a lot less, more primitive. But you know, now all our learners have had really great experiences on their computers where they see things looking pretty and animated and um, really designed well. And it's so nowadays if they open up a lesson and it's just black text on a white screen with words going from one margin to the other, before they even give it a chance, they're gonna dismiss it as not very modern or very powerful. And so whatever you do, Try to figure out, ask for a designer for Christmas because, or, or find a way that you can partner with somebody. Uh, maybe a student at your local community college could do an internship that would create some graphics for you if you find yourself really pinched. But it's one of those areas that I don't think you're able to dismiss anymore. Absolutely, Santa. And we'll have a lot of snowmen and gingerbread men available for hire after the holidays. So let us know if you need some graphic help. So Santa, here's a good one for you. Dear Santa, can you sneak into the Adobe Labs, put some electrodes in the authorware cadaver and bring it back to life? I can see the visual, the lightning, the red suit. Santa resurrects authorware. Seriously, Santa, nothing matches it, nothing. Signed, pining for an AW, authorware full Christmas, Rudolph. Well, you asked. <laughs> well, Rudolph. I uh, can only sympathize with you because I know how great authorware was. And I, invent I had all my elves working in it, and we were able to create the best interactivity. But I think resurrecting authorware is more than Santa can do. But you know, what, what was so great about authorware is that it was a way that designers who were not necessarily programmers could, could create interactivity that was more than just simple multiple choice questions that they really could, could think of design issues and implement them in a way with, that didn't um, make them hire developers who sometimes don't understand the learning um, restraints. I do have a little bit of good news, though, for you. I've been mentioning something called Zebra's Apps. And Dr. Allen, who really was the mastermind behind Authorware, is, is, as, was as frustrated as you with the fact that author is no longer a viable tool. And so he and his crew 
have been investing in a new tool called Zebra's Apps, and it really is taking some of the same ideas that led to Authorware, but really advancing them because you know that was done almost 30 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, and the technology has changed a bit. Our learners have changed a bit, and Zebra's Apps is taking care of uh, you know taking advantage of modern cloud technology to really enhance sharing between authors, but also creating a really neat visual environment so you don't have to really program in order to create some really nifty interactions. And um, the good news is, while some of you might know that Zebra Zaps has been out as sort of a personal version for a while, the professional version that will have LMS connectivity and um, event flows, so you can create bigger and more intricately structured applications, is going to be out very, very, very soon. So it's something that you may have maybe for Christmas or if not right after um, and I think you'll find that it really is something that you want to look into as the next best thing or and I actually think a better thing than authorware was but it's going to do that same sort of empowerment of your design. Perfect. Yay Zebra Zaps. Thanks Santa. So dear Santa, why don't people read pre-training materials and what's a training manager to do about it? Yours truly, Andy. Well, Andy, you know, sometimes our learners are not very good boys and girls. We tell them what to do, and they don't do it. And we tell them what to do again, and they still don't do it. And then we tell them, we figure out a different way to tell them, and they still don't do it. Well, you know, we talked earlier, people don't do what they're not motivated to do. And when we're talking to our learners, we need to be very careful about how we market what we're doing. Um, and it's more than just putting stuff in front of people. I've got a little example that I think Lisa Pingle is going to share with you about how important and how what a big impact it can be on exactly how you introduce an event. Yes, Santa. Oh, and this is just so interesting and kind of boring. This is a letter we got the Easter Bunny was going to hold a party for us, and he clearly doesn't know how to do it. To all employees, annual December cohesion event. Prepare for restricted high-carb cafeteria menu, compulsory overtime networking, uncompensated, of course, required compliance examination, poison hazards, isolation chamber, dry starch rations. Please prepare by reading the attached 42-page information packet. Please note, uniforms are mandatory. Santa, please help. Now, I'm sure the, who sent that letter, this is absolutely accurate and tells everything from their point of view that they were wanting to let people know about this event. But it just does not address anything that an attendee would be interested in. What I think would have been a better way to, to market this, I think you have a copy of something else, don't you, have Lisa Pringle? Absolutely. You're invited. A holiday party. Candies and sweets. Get to know your colleagues, secret Santa gift exchange, poinsettia decorations, videos and popcorn in the boardroom, wear your favorite holiday apparel. That sounds so fun, Santa. Yeah, doesn't that? And that's exactly the same event. And so I think, well, this is a, a little bit um, exaggerated. I think it, if you think about how you prepare learners, it often does not address where they are and what could possibly be of interest to them. So I think this is a place we, we tend to think learners are going to figure this out on their own and we really need to be marketers and do pre-learning events, set the stage, set expectations long before people actually get into the lesson so that they're excited, they know what's going on and if there is pre-training material that they need to prepare, we need to present it in a way that actually speaks to their interests rather than the interests of the organization. It really is all a matter of perspective. Now, just as a little illustration of how that can make an impact, I showed you that railroad training um, lesson before, and that's a situation where those truck drivers are, were not particularly interested in not driving and instead sitting down and taking some time to do a lesson. I mean, they're paid by being on the road and getting their loads delivered. But so it was really important to figure out how we could get people to think positively about this. And so what I'm going to show here 
But what Lisa's going to show is a little video, and this was done to be played on like the LCD panels at gas stations and be delivered through emails to get people excited about the potential that this event was going to be. So let's see that. this trip. Let's see how you score. So while that looked really fancy, you know, that wasn't that terribly difficult to put together. It was taking screenshots and with a little bit of movie work that you can do on any Mac, um, it created a nice little promo video that had a big impact on getting people interested and getting into that lesson because it seemed like it'd be a fun and useful thing to do. Absolutely. And Santa, we have one more letter before we give them a whole stocking full of, of takeaway materials. And this letter um, was great. It's from a, um, a, a client of ours, and um, we want to share with you as we can. Dear Santa, for Christmas, I would like the ability to add interactions as quickly as I can add text in my e-learning software. What's that? Uh-huh. You already gave me Zebra's apps. Okay then, for Christmas, I would like something better than our current ISD model. What's that? Right, you already gave me Sam. Then all I want for Christmas is Alan Interactions from Linda. P.S. I've been good all year. Great, and thank you so it much sure for doing- It does sound like you've been good, Linda. Congrats yes, she's been things. very good. Yes. So thank you. And, and thank you, Linda, and all the people that submitted letters. We'll be giving you big stocking full stuffers full of um, all kinds of great Allen material. Um, we do have a few questions we're going to cover here right before we go to the full stocking stuffer. Um, thank you to Steve Corbett, who commented that um, you can get a lot of learning right from that promo piece alone, which is absolutely true. True. And Santa, I think you agree from that Oli piece. A lot of people did learn a lot from that, and it definitely compelled learners to want to take the course. And um, Santa, someone's asking, let's see, Mitt here is asking generally a ballpark on what it would create to take, uh, take to create the Oli course. You know, Lisa Pingle, you were working on that more than I did on the, the development end. You know, I mean, it, it, took, it took several, you know, a good month of really detailed design and then um, some pretty te that one has some pretty technical programming behind it. That was a flash program, as you can imagine, to coordinate exactly where the trucks were stopping before each track and so forth. Um, yeah, can and you a bit about how much that. 
Absolutely, Absolutely, Santa. And the cool thing about that one, and somebody else had emailed in too or, or um, text in, what do you do to get ahead of the curve if you're getting designs that are coming in quickly? And it kind of relates to that. When we created that one for Oli, we knew we'd also be creating a um, version for bus school bus drivers. So a lot of the interactivity we built, we knew we could leverage with the second course. So the first one, I believe, was somewhere between 65 and 80,000. Um, but the second one, of course, there it's going to be less than half, probably a third of what it was to create the original one. So you can do a lot of pickup if you plan for interactions that will come. I know we had someone email in that they're getting PowerPoints the day before and have to create something. Really, if you can create any kind of interactive model that you can that you know has high engagement that will handle that content, it'll be a great way to get ahead of the curve on that. Yes, and I sort of think, I remember that our team our very first meeting was um, in March, and I know we had to deliver that like the second week of June. So that was sort of the time frame in which that whole piece was put together. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go to all the stocking stuffers we have for you today. And these are for everyone on the call. We welcome all of you to come to the Allen Interactions website. We are very, as we mentioned, committed to sharing and adding value to your business all of the time. We learn so much from our clients. Thank you so much. We learn a lot in the field and we are that's always making us smarter and stronger. And Santa's always willing to you know, share his graciousness and his um, knowledge with us in the form of all kinds of things. So reminder about the Leaving Addy for Sam book. Um, the blog, um, Santa is writing year round. Um, he's got a lot of jobs, so he's also doing that. A lot of great white papers for you out there um, that were mentioned throughout this. So the recording again will be available. We'd like you all to go to your chat windows here in closing. We'd love any feedback. Um, did you find this a value? What did you find a value? What would you have found more value? Would you like to see this an annual thing if we can get Santa back every year? Um, would you like to see that? And maybe we'll start it a little earlier in the year to solicit your Santa letters. So any, any kind of feedback you can give us, we really appreciate it. And with that, we're ending about a minute early here, which I know in this holiday spirit, everybody can use that extra little time. So Santa, any words in closing? No, just so happy to have spent this time with you and I'm looking forward to seeing and working with you and helping get good e-learning throughout all of next year. Yay, that's a great wish for 2013. And with that, on behalf of everyone here in Santa's workshop and the whole North Pole, we wish you a very, very, very merry holiday. And... Um, have a great new year.